Welcome to Sunnah Followers Open Forum. And today uh, we're going to have, inshallah, a very special uh, open forum. As you can see, the forum today will be conducted just by myself. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim Jamali is out uh, sick right now uh, with the COVID. Uh, everyone keep him in your supplication. And also Sheikh Morsi is unable to attend uh, due to Ramadan. Uh, he's not able to attend at this time uh, until later tonight. So uh, that leaves me by myself to die to do uh, this week's open forum. But inshallah, the open forum today will be very, very special because this forum today is designed uh, for those Muslims out there who have a very hard time uh, taking care of one of the greatest blessings that Allah has given us, and that blessing being our bodies. And we're in the month of Ramadan. In fact, we're almost coming to an end of the second week of fasting, and we're about to embark upon the third week of fasting, which will lead us to the last 10 days of Ramadan. So this month of fasting, this year of fasting is almost over. Yet there are many Muslims out there who Allah has blessed us with the wonderful concession of not having to struggle with fasting due to illnesses that we suffer with. But we choose to not take advantage, you know, of the, the blessings and the concessions that Allah gives us and we choose to instead allow our personal genes uh, to push us to be people whom Allah hate, people who are known as extremists, people who are known as fanatics, people who are known as those who make the religion hard on themselves. And we have to understand as Muslims that whenever we make Islam hard upon ourselves or others, we're making Islam ugly. And Allah hates ugliness. So that's going to be the focus, you know, of my talk uh, this week, uh, since I'm here by myself. And uh, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is uh, give you guys, you know, my thing, I always specialize in teaching Islam, the practicality of it, the ease of it, and how it never goes old, how it never dies, how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is our mentor in our lives, how his companions, they are the role models for us to look up to. They are the ones whose behavior we should try to emulate and imitate and adapt into our lives. So since I'm going to be here today uh, representing the forum, we're gonna serve two purposes. What I'm gonna do is give you the story of one of the great female companions, a companion that you hardly hear about here in the West. Her name is mentioned all over in the Middle East. There have been hospitals and schools even named after her. Her name was Rufeda El Islamia. And she was a very, very famous great companion because she was the first female doctor of Islam and the first nurse of Islam. I'm going to give you her story. I'm going to teach you how she chose to devote her life. And then I'm going to speak about how she, along with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, stressed the importance of caring for, for your sickness. And then after that, I will open up the forum and answer any questions that you may have about Ramadan and fasting and sickness. So with that said, uh, let me go ahead and start. In alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salamala, wa rasulullah. Rufayda al-Islamia. Rufayda al-Islamia is recognized as being not only the first Muslim nurse, 
but also the first Muslim female physician. Her full name was Rufayda bint Saud of the tribe of Aslam, which is one of the tribes of the Qajrish of the Confederation in Medina. She was born in Medina before the prophet migrated there. And she was one of the first people in Medina to accept Islam. She was amongst those Ansar women who welcomed the, the prophet singing when he arrived from Mecca. Rufayda's father was a physician and he shared his knowledge of medicine with her. She and her father established the first hospital and it was set up next to the prophet's mosque in Medina. She trained other women, including the prophet's wife, Aisha, to be nurses and to work in the area of health care. She was a capable leader and a capable organizer, and she was able to mobilize and get others to do good. Now, back in those days, uh, back in those days, women weren't assigned the responsibilities of conducting surgeries and amputations. These were solely done by the men in those days. But she practiced her medical skills in the hospitals that were set up in tents. For example, when Saud ibn Mu'ath uh, during the Battle of the Trench, you know, when he got injured during the Battle of the Trench, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered that he be carried to her for treatment. And she was the one that removed the arrow from his shoulder. In fact, Imam Bukhari records in his Sunnah that Aisha, the wife of the prophet says, on the day of the battle of the trench, the medial arm vein of Saud ibn Mu'ad was injured and the prophet ordered him to be placed in a tent in the mosque to be cared for. There was another tent set up for the tribe of Ghaffar and the blood started flowing from Saud's tent to the tent of Ghaffar. And the people began to shout, oh, occupants of the tent, what is coming from you to us? They went inside the tent and later found that Saud's room had bleeded profusely and he ended up dying in his tent. But he was cared for in that tent by Rufayda bent Islamia, okay? Rufayda implemented her clinical skills and her medical experience into developing the first ever documented mobile care unit. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions fought against their enemies, she always sent nurses whom she trained out onto the battlefields to treat the casualties. The severely wounded were carried back to her and her father in Medina. Remember, they ran the hospital, her and her father. So for the men that were severely injured on the battlefields, they would carry them back to her and her father to treat in Medina. And her nurses participated in the battles of Badr, Uhud, the Trench, Kanbar, and others. Imam Bukhari records that Rubaya bin Mu'ad bin Afra narrated, we used to go for military expeditions along with the prophet and provide the people with water and serve them and bring the dead and the wounded back to Medina. It is also narrated in Termidi, Daoud and El Nasai that Arfaja ibn Asad lost his nose in the battle of El Quleb during the Jahaliya. So he wore a nose made of silver. That nose became putrid. So the prophet told him to wear a nose made of gold. Rufayda was the one who assisted her father in shaping and making the first plastic surgery gold nose for him. Also in another instance, when the Muslim army prepared for the battle of Qaybar, Rufayda and a group of nurses went to the Prophet Muhammad asking permission to accompany them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave them permission and they did such a good job tending to the casualties that the Prophet assigned to them a share of the war spoils. And their share was equivalent to that of the soldiers 
who actually fought and participated. So Rufeda was a capable leader and organizer, and she spent her life helping to solve social problems that were associated with disease. And in turn, the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded his companions to seek medical attention when they were sick. He stressed this over and over in numerous hadiths. For example, Usama bin Sharik says, I was with the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and some Arabs came to him and asked him, O oh, prophet of Allah, should we take medicine when we are sick? He said, yes. Oh, you servants of Allah, take medicine because Allah has not created a sickness that doesn't have a cure except for one. And they asked, what sickness is that? Oh, Prophet of Allah, he said, that is the sickness of old age. And also in another narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, make use of medical treatment for Allah has not made a disease without appointing a remedy for it with the exception of one disease, and that is death. So we can see here that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam strongly encouraged his companions to seek medical attention whenever they were sick. And if a cure were known to exist for sickness, the Prophet would become angry if a person did not take the cure. Imam Bukhari, has recorded that um case tells us i went to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam along with a son of mine who was suffering with tonsillitis i had taken my finger and pressed it into his throat as a way of remedying it the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam looked at my son and became angry he said why do you pain your children by pressing their throats Simply give him some Indian incense because it cures seven diseases, one of which is pleurisy and the tonsil disease, if it is inserted in one side of the mouth. Subhana Allah. What would the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say if he were living today? And here we have the coronavirus, and there is a vaccination for it and we have many Muslims who are ignorant and refuse to take it, what would he say to them if he was angry because a person did not take the remedy for tonsillitis? Also, caring for sickness is so important in Islam that even during the month of Ramadan, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam demanded, I repeat, he demanded I repeat, he demanded that anyone who was sick break the fast. Imam Ahmed narrates that Ibn Umar said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood on the pulpit one day and he said, Allah loves for his concessions to be accepted just as he hates for acts of disobedience to be committed. And this hadith is classed as Sahih by El Bani, subhanAllah. Allah. Also, Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim narrates that Aisha said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was never given the choice between two things without choosing the easier of them unless it entailed sin. So again, here we are in the month of Ramadan, and there's a lot of Muslims who suffer with sicknesses. Allah has given us the concession of breaking the fast when you're sick, but we have many ignorant Muslims out there who sit around suffering with sicknesses, refusing to break the fast. Listen what Sheikh Utaymin said in Shah al mamtu He said from the hadiths of concession of the prophet, we realize the mistake made by many sick people for whom fasting is difficult and they and may even cause them harm but they refuse to break the fast we say that they are making a mistake when they do not accept the kindness of allah and the concession he has granted and they are harming themselves remember allah says 
in the Quran, la taqtulu and fusakum, which means do not kill yourselves. So I want you brothers and sisters out there who are fasting right now as I speak, and you are suffering with a sickness, and you're stupid, and I repeat, that's what it is, it's just plain stupidity. You are stupid, and instead of you accepting the concession of Allah by breaking the fast, you are choosing to fast. Understand that you are not doing yourself any good. We need to ponder the companion known as Rufeda. She was a noble woman who devoted her life to helping others overcome sicknesses and disease. She trained so many other women besides Aisha. For example, Um Amara, Amina, Um Ayman, Safiat, Um Sulaim, and Hind were also trained by her and worked as nurses on the field. And other Muslim women who worked with her were Kuyabiat, Amina bint Abi Case, Um Atiyah, and my predecessor, Nuseba bint Kab, Supana Allah. Being that this is the month of Ramadan, guys, this is the month that we should strive to show our gratitude towards Allah for the one blessing that is often overlooked and abused. And that blessing is our health. If you are sick and unable to fast, then break it. Subjecting yourself to the pain and agony of fasting while you are sick is not earning you any points with Allah. Instead, it shows your ignorance and your ingratitude of the concessions that Allah has given us. Let's change ourselves during this month of Ramadan. Remember, this is the month of self-evaluation. This is the month of change. Let's work on changing ourselves and let's strive to be like Rufeda. Let's strive to be like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and make good our points with the law by acknowledging and accepting the wonderful concessions he has given us and take care of our health. Remember guys, the body, the human body, it is a trust given to you by a law. And that body, that trust, it will either testify for or against you on the day of judgment. When that angel of death pulls your soul and you are lying in that grave, he's going to ask you, why did you not care? and take care of the trust that Allah had given you, which is your body. Why were you ignorant and stupid to not take advantage of the concessions Allah has given you? Many of us, we fall in the category of chronic illness. Many of us suffer with chronic illnesses such as diabetes, cancer, liver disease, hepatitis, and the likes. Allah has given us the concession of just simply paying the ransom rather than subjecting our bodies through that pain and the agony of trying to fast and deal with that sickness. But no, many of us want to be hard headed. Many of us want to prove something to the world because we're definitely not proving anything to Allah except how ignorant we are. But many of us want to prove to the world that we're Superman or that we're tough, that, that we're better than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or we're better than other humans. So we sit there fasting and our bodies deteriorating and our bodies getting sick and we're sitting around in hospitals, you know, crying out about how Allah has put the sickness here on the earth. But tell the truth, yes, Allah put the sickness here but Allah also gave us many concessions you are not honoring the concessions of Allah you are making yourself sick you are doing as Sheikh Uthameen said you are killing yourself Allah is not killing you that sickness it does not have the grip on you you put the sickness grip on yourself because you chose to fast instead of breaking your fast, taking the medicine that Allah has sent here on earth for us to take for our sicknesses. So 
that's my lecture for today. The story of this great female companion, Rufeda El Islamia. Nowadays, if you travel through the Middle East and other places in Asia, such as Pakistan, there are many hospitals named in her honor, many schools established in her honor. She's known as the Florence Nightingale of the Muslim world. She stressed taking care of your body. She stressed being thankful for the concessions that Allah has given us to fight against sickness and disease. Let's take advantage of those concessions. So that concludes my lecture, my little short lecture on one of the female companions that we can study from and learn from. And so now what I wanna do is open the floor up to any questions that any of you may have about Ramadan, any questions you may have about fasting or what breaks the fast, what doesn't break the fast, and the likes. And by the way, guys, let me stress to you too, paying the ransom. If you fall in the category of having a sickness of which that, that is incurable, and if fasting agitates that sickness, so you have to break the fast, when you pay the ransom, the ransom is your fast. So I don't know why anyone would be foolish to not break their fast. What are you doing? You're stupid, you know? And many of us suffer with chronic illnesses. I have a chronic illness that I suffer with too. Alhamdulillah, I'm fasting now. Every day I start my day attempting to fast. But when I feel my sickness act up, oh, I do not hesitate to break it. I will break it in a heartbeat and just pay the ransom for that day. Okay, any questions, any comments, please get on the microphone. Let's hear it. Questions about fasting? Ramadan, sickness, any of that. Let's hit it. And the people on Zoom, uh, Facebook, uh, inshallah, if you have any questions or comments, you can type them and inshallah, I can see uh, your comments as well. Pregnant women. Again, we talk about this over and over and over again. Pregnant women, they must fast too. Just because you are pregnant does not exempt you from fasting. Unless your doctor has diagnosed you as being a high risk pregnancy, you must fast just like anyone else. The difference is this though, according to, uh, from the understanding of Ibn Abbas, if you are pregnant and you have to break your fast, say because of the morning sickness or whatever, then instead of you making that day up later after Ramadan, uh, you instead you pay the ransom, okay? you pay the ransom. That's the only difference. Does everyone understand that? If you are a pregnant woman, you are obligated to fast. However, if you should get sickness and have to break your fast for a day or so, you pay the ransom for those days. You keep track of the days that you had to break your fast. Now, if you are put in the category of a high risk pregnancy, and that category is determined by your Muslim doctor. And if you are high risk, you wouldn't be sitting around, walking around, you'd be in the bed. High risk pregnancy women are confined to the bed and it's not a nice thing to do, to be, because you're worrying about miscarrying. If you are diagnosed by your doctor as being high risk pregnancy, in that case, you don't have to fast at all. Instead, you pay the ransom for those days. Is that clear about the pregnant women? And for those of you who are ignorant enough to think that it's gonna harm the baby, all I can tell you is that's just plain ignorance. You need to learn about the human body. Allah has made the human body a wonderful, wondrous miracle. A baby is not gonna die because you go 12 hours without eating. In fact, you're doing the baby much more good than harm, okay? 
I have a, a person, one of my students here, a sister Fam A, uh, she's seven months pregnant, seven months pregnant, and she's been fasting every day. And alhamdulillah, she'll tell you this is her first pregnancy, and she's a young girl who grew up here on my website. She says, Sister Layla, I'm fasting, and alhamdulillah, everything's good, no problem. So for you women that want to look for an excuse to not fast because you're pregnant, what I can tell you is something that you're not going to hear from other diet. But you know, Layla, I'm going to keep it real. And since this is my forum today, and I'm answering the questions here today, then let me just tell you, think about it. When, you, when that child grows up, the day that that child disrespects you and talks back to you, I want you to think about this moment when you were pregnant with that child and you chose to disobey your Lord. Well, maybe Allah will make you suffer the consequences because remember for the whatever choices we make in this world, there's always consequences. Well, maybe that child growing up to disrespect you is because you disrespected Allah by not obeying him and fasting when you were carrying it in your stomach hello think about that okay yes yeah, so but to answer the question and keep it short yes pregnant women are obliged to fast okay but if if you should have to break it due to the morning sickness that can sometimes be bad for some women you have to pay the ransom for that day breastfeeding women breastfeeding women must fast too Breastfeeding women must fast too. However, the difference with the breastfeeding woman is this. If her milk dries up, because there's some rare cases, it happens. Not all the time, but it sometimes happens. The breastfeeding woman may experience uh, drying up of her milk. Should that happen to you, then uh, you can stop fasting and pay the ransom for those days or you can choose to get some infamil and put the baby on the bottle. It's up to you. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Sister Carmetta. How are you? Okay, how are you? Good, alhamdulillah. My son asked if there's anything else that breaks the fast besides food and drink. Mashallah, this is, okay, mashallah, this is a good question that many adults even ask. Okay, the only thing that breaks the fast is putting something into your mouth and swallowing it into your stomach. Okay, that's really basically the only thing. A lot of people ask me, uh, Sister Layla, I'm a diabetic and I have to take insulin. Insulin does not break the fast. The injections that you have to shoot into yourself, any type of injection does not break the fast. Say, for example, you had to go get the corona shot, the corona vaccine. That does not break the fast either because that is an injection that goes into the muscle. OK, uh, but however, say I was having a, a headache and I wanted to take some Tylenol, that would break the fast because that entails taking some pills, putting them in my mouth and swallowing them into my stomach. So if you take take any medication by mouth, this will break the fast. But if there is an injection, a medication of an injection, that does not. Also allergy shots. A lot of people are suffering with allergies uh, this time of year. Allergy shots do not break the fast either because these are, again, injections. But to take something, put it in your mouth, and swallow it into your stomach, that's what breaks the fast. So very good question. You know? And of course, um, we adults understand, too, that uh, that breaks the fast, too. Be having intimate relations uh, with your spouse uh, while fasting, this too breaks the fast. Um, a lot of children ask about wet dreams. A lot of our 13 year old children ask about wet dreams. Do wet dreams break the fast? The answer is no. Because again, remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us that when we are sleeping, 
the pen is lifted. We're not held accountable for what happens in our sleep. So if you should wake up after having a wet dream and a wet dream, you would know what it is for someone's asking what it is. You know what it is. I don't have to go into detail. You know, if you're having a wet dream, you would know it. You'd wake up uh, uh, in that state. And when that happens, uh, you simply just get up, take a gusso. That means get in a shower, take a shower, wash yourself from head to toe, immerse your entire body in water from head to toe, and uh, you're good to go. But your fast is still valid. That's only from the wet dream. Okay, but masturbation, masturbation breaks the fast too. Why? Because this was deliberate and this was intentional. And as a parent, you parents need to stress this to your children. I know it's a topic that many of us are not comfortable talking about, but believe you me, you need to let your teenage children, your puberty children know that masturbation does break the fast, but wet dreams do not. And you can explain to them the difference and why. Okay, very good question from that sister too. Any other questions? Salam alaikum, yes. Sister Layla. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. So my question is, um, I know a couple people that uh, go to uh, Perth and they get those hydration IVs. Will that wreck the fast if you get it? What's a, what is it? I don't, what is it? I don't know what it is. What is this thing? It's a hydration IV. It's an injection. It's basically an IV. You get it to like uh, for hydration. Okay. Anything that you put into your body that's of a nutrient breaks the fast. If it's a nutrient. Okay. So if you're putting inside, going through uh, the, your veins to put of uh, uh, nutrients, food, nutrients, and such into your body, then that would break your fast. Does everybody understand that? So if you're having, and this is why um, having a kidney dialysis, kidney dialysis breaks the fast because this entails uh, putting sugars into your blood and stuff. So if you're having some type of infusion, which is of nutrients or sugar and things like that, that does break the fast. Does everyone understand? That does because you're placing inside the blood and body nutrients of food sources, food nutrients. Okay. So that will break the fast. Okay. Any other questions? Having your blood drawn? No, this does not break the fast. Uh, you might have to go to the doctor, say you have an appointment to go get blood work done. Having blood work taken from you does not break the fast. And you can figure out why, because whereas what Sister Arij was asking about is putting, putting nutrients in the body, having the blood removed, you're removing from the body. So blood, uh, having blood extracted from you does not break the fast because you're just simply taking blood out. You're not putting any nutrients of any uh, food source or sugars in the body. So that's the difference between, you know, having uh, blood taken out and putting uh, uh, nutrients in the body. So having blood work done does not break the fast. Also uh, seeking, uh, going to a gynecologist a lot of women have to may have a gynecologist appointment. You have to have a pap smear done. Okay, pap smears does not break the fast because the doctor is not putting anything inside your stomach. He's not putting no, no food uh, uh, values inside you. Okay, everybody understand that? So uh, uh, pap smears and things like that do not break the fast. Okay, we have a new Muslim here, um, Brother Robert Hor Horwath. I normally don't read the text, 
But being that he's a new convert, I'll just read his text, not anyone else's. Okay, he says, Sister Layla, what supplication do I make uh, if I broke the fast by eating and drinking as a new Muslim? I forgot. Okay, this is a good question. First of all, Brother uh, Robert, welcome to Islam. Uh, 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 may Allah, uh, um, brother, your name is Ibrahim. Okay, mashallah, we welcome to Islam. May Allah uh, uh, guide you uh, with the correct knowledge and understanding of the deen, I mean. Secondly, Allah does not hold us accountable for what we forget either. That's the mercy of Allah. Not only does Allah give us as Muslims many concessions to help us make it through uh, uh, the, the obligations such as, fa as fasting, but he doesn't hold us accountable for what we forget. So say, for example, you are fasting, Brother Robert, and you forgot, you just, you know, and you made you uh, some coffee. It happens to me. I was born Muslim, been Muslim all my life. I make that mistake. I'll go in there and make a frappuccino, sit here and drink it, be halfway done and say, oh, stuck for law, I'm fasting. <clears throat> the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when that happens and you remember, just stop eating and continue to fast because that food came from Allah. In other words, you must have needed it. <clears throat> so there is no supplication for you to say. Okay, since you accidentally ate something, just continue with your fast and your fast will be accepted. Also, that is the purpose. Uh, everybody else, please stop typing because when y'all type into the brother, I can't see what he's typing to me. Y'all know I can't see. So just let me answer the brother, okay? Because I done lost what he was saying. He said something that I was gonna, wait a minute, let me scroll. Please, no typing. I don't want y'all to type. I want y'all to get in the habit of using the microphone. This is 2021. We're gonna have to learn how to talk like the hypocrites can talk and like the innovators. The innovators and the hypocrites, they know how to get on the mic and express themselves. The people at Asuna, they cower away, afraid to pick up a microphone. Lord have mercy and a camera too. So no typing in here, talk. But for the new brother here, um, he was asking something and don't type, let me find it. What did he say? Uh, I felt guilty. Okay, well, don't feel guilty, uh, Brother Robert. Uh, Allah is not a brute. Allah does not hold us accountable for the things that we, the mistakes we make. So just simply continue your fast and your fast will be accepted. And that's also the purpose of the, um, Zakat, the, the sadaqah fitter that we pay at the end of Ramadan. That little $10 that you pay on behalf of yourself at the end of Ramadan before the prayer, that will make up for any mistakes in your fast. So don't feel guilty, uh, just continue with your fast and uh, don't worry about it, okay? Uh, may Allah bless you, okay. <clears throat> No, you're fine. That's where we're now having the uh, question and answer session. So any other questions that you may have, uh, Brother Robert or Brother Ibrahim, go ahead and type them. Any questions about fasting or you can type them or you can use the mic if you like. Either one. Anyone else with any questions? The rest of you get on the mic. Don't do no typing. Except the people on Facebook. You can type. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you forget you were fasting and you make a mistake and eat something, just continue with your fast. It happens to the best of us. Yes, yes, that's the same thing I was saying to this brother. Exactly, you continue with your fast. And when you pay that uh, uh, zakat al-fitr at the end of Ramadan, that will compensate for any mistakes you made with your fast. Exactly. Yes, it shows how merciful Allah is. You know, Allah has given us so many wonderful concessions in this religion to help us to fulfill our obligations to him. It's just that either we're not educated of them or we're too ignorant to apply them. Because remember, Allah tells us in the Quran that we are, we humans are ignorant by nature. 
He created us to be attracted to the things that are bad and dangerous for us. And he also created us to be ignorant by nature. So that's why he tells us to seek knowledge, seek knowledge, seek knowledge of his religion so we can appreciate him more and take advantage of the beautiful concessions that he has set in place for us, even during the month of Ramadan. Okay, let me look. Yeah, here's another question. Yes, oh, oh, subhanAllah. Question from one of the sisters on Facebook. My, mashallah, welcome. Um, yes, may Allah bless you too, sister. Thank you for following me on YouTube and thank you for uh, participating. Part yes, thank you for participating here. Yes, you can join the Zoom room if you like to. The Zoom room, guys, can be accessed at www.sunafollowers.net. It's open 24 hours. Just click on the join live class and it'll bring you right here. Yes. Oh, Supana Allah. Okay, she has a problem here. And this happens a lot with our new converts. We convert to Islam and we marry men who tell us things about the religion and we find out otherwise. She's just now sharing with me here on Facebook that she's a new convert. She's been Muslim for less than a year. And uh, her husband told her that she can't fast unless she has his permission. <laughs> okay, so she's saying that she did not fast the first week of Ramadan because her husband told her he didn't want her fasting. He preferred that she did not fast because he figured it would be harder on her to fast and work, okay, she does something in the medical field. She works in the, in the medical field, okay? Mashallah, she's on the uh, front lines. She works uh, doing something, she's a nurse. I'm assuming that's a x-ray technician. Okay, she's an x-ray technician and she works at the hospital. And uh, her husband, when Ramadan began, uh, she said that she listened to lectures on uh, social media and she heard that we're supposed to start fasting. So she began fasting, but her husband told her to break her fast because he doesn't think that it's wise for her uh, to fast and, and work. Okay, this is an example as to how important it is for new Muslims, because her husband's a new Muslim too. So I'm not going to even jump on her husband because her husband's a new convert too. They both converted together. That's why it is so important for those of you who convert to Islam to immediately find a teacher. Every Muslim should have a teacher. Every Muslim should have a teacher. Every Muslim, including myself, should have a teacher. And I do have a good one. His name is Abu Atayyab. What's yours? Okay, you have to have a teacher. You cannot teach yourself Islam. Okay, yeah, she said her husband found out during the second week. Okay, that's when she and her husband found out that they're supposed to fast Ramadan. And this is talking about voluntary fast. Exactly. That's how easy it is for us to read a hadith and totally misconstrue the meaning of it. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about a woman seeking approval from her husband to fast, he's not speaking about Ramadan. Ramadan is an obligation that Allah has imposed upon all Muslims, male and female. No one can tell you to not fulfill an obligation that Allah has imposed upon us. So when you read the hadiths, and the hadiths that mention a woman seeking her husband's approval, that's for a voluntary fast because you don't have to do any other fast other than Ramadan. 
So if you're gonna do a voluntary fast, you should seek your husband's approval because maybe he might have plans for you and he to do some something else. But for making up a day of Ramadan or fasting a day of Ramadan, you do not seek anyone's approval and you cannot break the fast. Even if, I mean, unless there's a valid reason, your husband cannot tell you that he doesn't want you to fast Ramadan. OK, because Ramadan is something that he must do and you and there is no obedience to the creation over the creator. OK, mashallah. Yeah, she said that, uh, uh, in fact, she said it was when she she was listening to me on YouTube, watching my videos on YouTube, and she heard me, her and her husband heard me say in one of my lectures to you guys that, you know, the fast of Ramadan must be fulfilled. And that's when they realized they were wrong. Yes, yes. But sister, I encourage you and your husband to strongly uh, seek uh, proper knowledge of the religion, you know, find a teacher and cling to that teacher. You're welcome to participate in all my classes. I have classes all day and night here, just about, you know, all day and night, <laughs> it seems like. And you know, and and I'm always here to answer and help you uh, with anything you may have about Islam. If there's something I can't help you with, then I can contact uh, Sheikh Morsi. Okay. All right. Here's another question. I am a nurse, and I can tell you it is not hard to fast. After two days, your body gets used to it. Personally, I don't feel hungry or thirsty when I'm at work. The only thing I feel after work day is a little tired. That's all. Exactly. Yeah, we have a lot of nurses here. Uh, Sister Faiza, uh, who did the uh, Islam for Kids class, Faiza is a nurse too. She has her BSN and she works uh, as a nurse and she fasts and everything too, with no problem. Alhamdulillah. And my daughter's a nurse. Okay. Uh, Brother Robert, uh, Brother Ibrahim said, as a male Muslim, am I allowed to have a woman teacher in the dean? Yes. There is no discrimination against males and females when it comes to seeking knowledge. Many of the early scholars, you know, had teachers that were female because some of the best teachers were female. For example, the prophet's wife, Aisha. Aisha became one of the first scholars of Islam. OK, also Zainab, the daughter of Umm Salama. She became one of the one of the first scholars of Islam, and she had many, many, many uh, uh, men who uh, learned from her. Yes, as long as there's a barrier between you and she, you can learn. What do I mean by a barrier? Well, we have Zoom. As long as you're learning from her on Zoom, you're coming here, for example, learning from me on Zoom, we're not together alone, then it's lawful. And I have many male students. Brother Ahmad is one of my male students. Um, Brother Tarek is one of my students. Uh, Brother Muhammad Shamim, who teaches the Quran Tajweed, he was one of my students. So I have a lot of male students too, yes. Yeah, but you have to have a teacher, a bona fide qualified teacher of the dean. Okay, otherwise you'll make those type of mistakes like uh, this sister and her husband made. And alhamdulillah that Allah uh, guided them to the, the truth about fasting during Ramadan. Okay, any other, okay, what is this? Yeah, vitamin B12 injection. Okay, if you're injecting yourself with nutrients, nutrients and food stuff, then yes, many of the scholars will say that that breaks the fast because you are in putting inside your blood, which goes into your stomach, food stuff, food stuff. Okay. Yeah, injecting yourself with a food uh, source is not the same as uh, injecting yourself with something like uh, the, a vaccine, which is not a food source. Okay. <clears throat> okay, if someone suffers with from panic anxiety attacks, <clears throat> 
to the point that they pass out or have symptoms of dissociation due to PTSD, can they break their, yes. Yes, now that I personally have experienced a panic attack, I had my first panic attack a few months ago. Yes, it's a scary thing. You don't want, you know, if you are having a panic attack, you know, you can break your fast and take the medicine. You know, there's pills that the doctors give you that will help to calm you down. You know, again, just like Rufeda El Islamia <clears throat> would encourage, just as the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, told the companions, break your fast. If you're suffering from an anxiety attack to the point where you know you're about to pass out, where your mind, your head is going crazy, you break your fast immediately and take that hydro, whatever it's called, I have it too. I got those pills I carry with me. So if I have an attack, I'll pop it in my mouth in a heartbeat. Yes, you take that pill to calm you down. And you make that day up. You understand the difference is you make that day up. You don't pay a ransom for that day. You make that day up. Okay because that's not really considered a chronic illness. You know, cause it's a, a illness that can go away. It's not an illness in which your life is in danger. So Sister Zainab, uh, panic attacks are not chronic illnesses. So if I was having a panic attack right now, had to break my fast, I'd break it and have to make that day up. Not paying a ransom, but by fasting, <clears throat> okay? Yeah, a law doesn't want you to end up <clears throat> in a bad situation <clears throat> to do the fasting. And should say, for example, a person is suffering from a panic attack and that person actually does pass out. And when they wake up, it's after my grip. Is the fast valid? Yes, as long as you were fasting when you fell out, you understand? So as long as you were fasting uh, before you went unconscious and uh, that day does count, you don't have to, you know, that day counts for you. You understand, Zainab? Yeah, because that happens sometimes. You can have a panic attack and fall out unconscious. I know, because I experienced it almost. Yeah. See how merciful a law is. This is why the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would get angry when he heard of, a, of a, a companion being sick and fasting. He would say, what are you doing? Break your fast. Accept the concessions of Allah. Accept the mercy of Allah, people. Yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay. Someone is asking, what do you do <clears throat> if you feel that your fast is getting hard? Well, it's simple. The days get longer as your fast gets harder for you. Take your mind off the fast. Do something to take your mind off of it. Go ahead and, and read a book watch a little television, you know, do something to take your mind off the fast. Okay. Take a nap, but don't let it get to you to the point where as you end up breaking your fast unnecessarily. So if the day is getting long and you're becoming tired, the fast is getting harder for you, then go ahead and uh, 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 read a, a book or watch some television or take a nap, do something to take your mind off the fast so as not to break it. <clears throat> and that's something that we should be uh, enforcing with our children, especially any child that's over the age of 10. Because remember, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, teach your children to fast when they're seven, make them fast when they're 10. So if you have children that's over the age of 10 or 10 or over, you should, you know, the day gets longer, let them play a little bit of X, Xbox for a couple hours to take their mind off of it. Let them go ahead and watch Mortal Kombat. It's a good movie. I just saw it the other day. Watch a little bit of Mortal Kombat to take their mind off of it to pass a couple hours by. Okay. 
Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Leila. Wa alaikum salam. Um, speaking of a child, um, can a parent make up a day of a child that is under the age of 15? If him, yeah. I think so I already asked you that question. Um, uh, the first week of Ramadan, when I told you that my son did not fast um, for the first week of Ramadan because he had a stomach ache. And he's 12, by the way. And you told me that um, he has to make that day up. Yes, he has to yeah. make it up, not you. He has. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. that's his sin. Not, I mean, not sin, but you know, <clears throat> that's just like saying, okay, well, I had my menses, so my husband's going to fast for me. No, fasting is a personal act of worship between you and a law. <clears throat> this is between you and a law. This is the one deed that we do for a law. <clears throat> so you have to make your days up. The only time somebody can make those days up for you is if you were dead. Do you understand? Say, for example, I die tomorrow. But I had two days. I broke my uh, fast. I had to break my fast two days this month and didn't live to make them up. That's one of the debts that you can pay off for me. The debts that we owe to Allah are debts that can be paid off. So when I'm dead, <clears throat> you knew that I had two days to make up, then you can fast on behalf of me. But if I'm living, no, no one can make up my fast for me, but me. So your son is an adult now. He's 15. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whenever a child reaches the age of 15, that child is considered an adult, whether that child has had a menses or, or a wet dream or not. So your son, if he's 15, you know, no, he's 12, as it was. okay, he's 12. He's, is he's, yeah. he's probably still puberty. Yeah. He's 12. No, he's, he's not. He's not. Okay. No, he's not. You sure he's not puberty? No, he's not hundred percent sure. Yes. <laughs> he's not. <laughs> okay. Well, if he's not puberty, then, uh, but still he has to make it up himself. He's not dead. You're living. Yeah. So that, and that's good training for him. That's good training for him to learn how to make up his days. So since he had to break his fast bec uh, because uh, he of uh, whatever a sickness, then just tell him to make it up after Ramadan. Anytime after Ramadan, when Ramadan is over, except for the day of the E, we cannot fast the day of the E. But he he can make that day up anytime after that. You can't make it up for him. He can make it up himself. That's good training for him. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. But does everybody get the rest of the answer, though? Say, for example, you died and you owed some days of fasting to a law, then your family or your friend can make it up for you. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah. OK, good. Uh, Any other questions? Sorry, I'm Sister Leila. I have a quick question. Yeah, why they come to my so if I wanted to do the six days after Ramadan, can I do the six days on top of making up the days I've missed due to my menses? Or is it like first make up my, men my menses days and then do the six days? Yeah, this is a good question. And I want everyone to understand the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, until you fulfill your obligatory obligations, your voluntary deeds are not accepted. So if you want to, to fast any voluntary fast, you have to first make up the Ramadan because Ramadan is an obligation. <clears throat> and this question comes up every year because that's how shaitan works. Shaitan wants you to focus on doing deeds that you don't have to do. So as you forget about the things you need to do so that when you in that grave, you can be punished in that hellfire for not fulfilling your obligations. So if you want to fast any voluntary fast, you have to first make up the days you missed of Ramadan. Does everybody understand that? Then after you make up the days from Ramadan, then you can do six days of Shawwal or Arafat or, or Ashura or whatever else you want to. But until you do the Ramadan and complete Ramadan, it's not going to count. Okay? So for you women who want to do voluntary fast after Ramadan, then after the Eid prayer, get busy making up your days. And then you can fast six more days of Shawal. 
but those days are not going to count until you make up Ramadan first. The Hadith is Ramadan followed by. That means Ramadan first and then. Okay. Good question. Any other questions? If you're taking the COVID vaccine, if you're taking the COVID vaccine, we strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you break your fast after getting the vaccine and take the Tylenol, okay? Because a lot of people are having, with the second dosage, with the second dose of that vaccine, there's a lot of people experience uh, side effects. The headache, and that headache ain't nothing to play with because I went through it too you know, or the, the chills. So it's highly recommended that when, after you get that second injection, uh, go ahead and take that uh, two tight. When I went to take my second shot at my job, they had the Tylenol right there in my waiting. They said, take it because you're gonna have a headache. And I did, I'm glad I did because when I was driving home, I felt it, it was like, whoa, woo. But thank God I had taken those two Tylenol. I was able to make it home safely and I was fine. Okay. And it, every four hours, take that Tylenol. So if you're getting that COVID vaccine, you know, they're, the people that vaccinate you will tell you, here, take the Tylenol. So, uh, so if you have any side effects, it'll be to your betterment. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, and each day of fasting uh, should be easier and easier for you, like Sister Mariam said. I mean, we're going, getting ready to go into, I'm going to tell you, Ramadan's almost over. We're getting ready to go into the third week of fasting. And what does the third week hold? We, that's when we start looking for those last 10 days of Ramadan. We're almost done. We're almost there at the end of fasting. So, you know, it goes by fast. I mean, it's, and alhamdulillah, we're not fasting in the hot summer this year. <laughs> the hardest time to fast is in the month of July and August. SubhanAllah, you know, we're moving up. We're in the spring now. It goes up a month each year, you know, so it's getting a little bit more easier. Um, but the thing is that I have to stress the problem that I see uh, with many Muslims are those people who fall in the category of chronic illness, the people for whom Allah has made the concession for, people who don't have to fast due to an illness, these are the people that I am just shocked at. You know, rather than break their fast when their sickness acts up, they want to try to be a masochist to themselves. You know, they oppress themselves by uh, making themselves fast. And that's just ridiculous. It's ludicrous. It's really ludicrous. The Prophet Muhammad would be very angry if he got angry at a mother for trying to treat tonsillitis on her own by pushing up the, 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 the stuff instead of giving him the medicine. What would he say to you? We're crazy Muslims who fall in the category of chronic illnesses and you sitting up killing yourself, sitting up in a hospital you know, got yourself on camera in a hospital talking about, oh, may Allah take this sickness away. You know, may Allah open up your, your heart and your mind to the truth, dude. Okay. The sickness is under control. You need to get yourself under control and stop being so fanatical and extreme. You know, we hear all these doers about this sickness. Get over it. Allah, uh, I'm going to tell you guys, Allah has the corona under control. Look at the reality, the coronavirus is under control. Allah has sent us the cure. He has sent us the treatment, just as he sent us the way to treat the flu and other illnesses and viruses. So the corona is under control. It's just you and I are not under control. 
Either we're too far to the right or we're too far to the left. Either you are fanatic, crazy, masochist, or you're an uncaring, slobbing, slovenly person. So it's not about, oh Allah, get the sickness under control. It's, oh Allah, get me under control. Oh Allah, guide the Muslims to the truth. Oh Allah, guide the Muslims to following Islam and its truthfulness. The way the prophet taught us, oh Allah, make the Muslims stop being fanatical and bring them back to the Sunnah. That's the duel we need to be making because the corona sickness is under control. Go take your shots. Do the social distancing when you go to the mosque, you brothers. When you brothers go to the mosque to pray your tarot, we put a mask on it. No hugging, no kissing. That hugging and kissing, that ain't the way we greet each other anyway. What's the greeting of Islam? We shake hands, assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam, and shake hands. All that, uh, uh, that cultural hugging and kissing, it's about social dis. Uh uh, we don't hug. Let's shake hands. Hey, let me get my glove. Put that glove on and shake hands. The corona is under control. It's you that is not under control. Go to the mosque, do your Tartar Week, wear a mask. I was looking at, um, I was broadcasting uh, the Tartar Week prayer uh, for one mosque last night. And the first, the front row were men who didn't have no mask on. They sitting up in there and they coughing too. Coughing in the Tartar Wee line, <coughs> no mask on. You know, you imams, it's your responsibility to enforce the laws and the rules in the mosque. You should be one of those imams like Sheikh Morsi. Sheikh Morsi has a box of uh, a mask. You ain't getting in his mosque unless you put a mask on. Sheikh Morsi has somebody standing at the door to hand you a mask and you go in and you can stand side by side, ankle to ankle with a mask on and do tartar wheat. But some of you imams are allowing men to come into the mosque with no mask on. They're all, well, you're on video. I'm sitting here broadcasting your video to my Zoom room and here in the front line. <coughs> <coughs> A stock for law. Put the mask on. Stop all that hugging and kissing and sh put your glove on and shake hands. Bring back the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If the Prophet were living today, he would have Umar stationed at the entrance of the mosque to pass out masks like, like Sheikh Morsi does. He'd have Umar standing there to pass masks out there, all the brothers who come in for Tartar Week. Okay, take the precautions. The corona is under control. It's just that we are not. We're deviating more and more away from practicing this religion the right way. Instead of us trying to earn brownie points with Allah, we're trying to earn brownie points with each other due to our ignorance and our stubbornness and our arrogance. The three things that destroyed the Jews. The Jews used to be the chosen people, but their ignorance, their stubbornness, and their arrogance stood in the way. The prophet said that we Muslims would end up becoming just like those Jews, ignorant, stubborn, and arrogant. And sitting around on social media making videos saying, oh Allah, take away the illness, <coughs> no mask on fasting at that when you under the, the the category of a ransom holder ask a law to take away the ignorance from the people that's the supplications we need to all be making not about the corona because the law has sent the remedy a law has sent the remedy to the corona take it apply it okay any other questions Remember, guys, your body, our body, 
It is a trust between us and Allah. Your body will testify for or, for or against you. It's going to say, oh, Allah, it, he knew, she knew that I was sick and my body was filled with sickness. But she, instead of her breaking her fast and paying the ransom, she chose to fast just to impress the people. And she made videos of herself fasting, talking about take away the sickness. And the people not knowing that she in the category of a, uh, of a ransom payer. Hello, you making fool the people, but you can't fool a law, guys. Stop trying to please the people and please a law. Do what is, this is Ramadan. We're supposed to be working on trying to better our relationship with a law. Let's work on pleasing a law. Forget about making videos, putting it on Facebook for the people to see. Make, make a video for, uh, for a law. Show a law, look a law, I'm breaking my fast, you know, because I fall in the category and then make two rock cards. Thank you, a law. Thank you, a law, for the concession you've given me. Do that instead of making videos to try to uh, show off for the people. Prove yourself to a law. Everybody understand that. And that goes for myself too. That's why when I feel my, my sickness act up, I break it. I'll sit right here on camera and break it right in front of y'all. Yep, I'm done. Pay the ransom, write it down another day. I'm gonna end up paying 200 bucks probably. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if there is no other questions, we're going to close this session of our forum out. Um, I want everybody to uh, make dua for all the Muslims, all the believers here on earth. Ask and ask Allah. You know, it makes you include all the believers in your supplication when you break your fast. Ask Allah to uh, better the believers here on earth, to raise us up higher in our status with Him, uh, to keep us away from ignorance to strengthen our iman, to strengthen our understanding of this religion and our practice of it. Include that in all your supplications and then make do it for yourself, asking Allah to save you from the hellfire, save you from ignorance, save you from those actions that are displeasing to him. Include that in your personal supplications. Okay, so we'll stop right here. Uh, I want to remind everyone that we do have another class today, uh, the um, Hadith class, uh, the 100 Advices by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That class will be held tonight at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayka.